So first, uh, we're going to start off with a land acknowledgement. Uh, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus acknowledges that the ancient ancestors of the Eastern Woodlands tribe, now referred to as the Adena and the Hopewell cultures, inhabited the land we know as Ohio. Their descendants include the living nations of the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandot, Delaware, and Seneca, Cayuga. We honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this place where we gather. Uh, we also want to thank our sponsors, including the, Greatest Columbi the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, dude, uh, Columbus Here's Foundation, Columbia. UBS, whatever that is, uh, the Japan Foundation, and our other festival sponsors. All these programs and the expo are free to attend because of their support. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, we are here for a panel that I think is about small press publishing. And um, that's you know such an amazing thing that this whole thing is about. There's so many amazing small presses here in the building and at this table right here. So um, I'm, I'm, we're all very excited to have you here. Um, let me start off by introducing our panelists. Um, so we got, we've got uh, Sean over here. Uh, Sean Knickerbocker is the publisher of Rust Belt Review, uh, which is an anth. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, please correct me if I make something up. Totally. Well, it, if it sounds better than what it is, I'm just gonna let you I've, keep it. I've got this speech impediment where I, I can say something and it sounds like with authority, like I know what I'm talking about, and like just don't <laughs> let me get away with that. So, uh, Rust Belt Review is an anthology. Um, I actually, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let all of everyone introduce their own thing once we. Uh, yeah, how about, let me, I'll say who you are. You announce who you are and what your project is, and then we'll, we'll go around and do that. So how about, okay. let's, let's start with Brian and then just go down. <laughs> <laughs> we keep it chaotic. Yeah, my name's, my name's Brian. Uh, I make Bubbles fanzine. It's like a fanzine, uh, you know, interviews and reviews of new books coming out, all mostly alternative comics and some manga. And I've published... Um, Two books so far, an old 40s manga called Bat Kid, which maybe some have, and uh, a book for Ryan Holmberg that was like a, kind of like a diary kind of thing. And I have a new book for this guy, Anon, and he's a cartoonist from Delhi, India, and that'll be out actually in just like a couple weeks. I wish I had it here, but I uh, don't have them yet. But then doing another manga. So anyways, I've done a few books, but I don't have any with me. So Hell yeah. Uh, Sean, want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah. So... Um, uh, close. I've been making comics for like 17 years now and for a long time I was just making mini comics um, doing my own thing and then in 2021 I really wanted to start increasing the amount of books I was making because I am a bookmaker by trade um, but I can only draw so fast so I thought it'd be a good solution to start putting out like a quarterly anthology type thing so that's what Rust Belt Review is so it's a bunch of cartoonists kind of making work in the same vein or the same interests of my own, you know, like slice of life kind of stuff. Some of the stories are serialized, some aren't. Um, we just finished serializing this comic called Tunnel Vision by Audra Stang. And uh, I'm now starting to branch out to doing these kind of chapbooks. So this is one of the first chapbooks we're putting out, which is a collection of Audra's work that she had uh, put out in Rust Belt Review. Hell yeah, thank you. And um, Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself yeah. and what your project is? Um, my name is Andrew Alexander. I've been making comics for about 10 years. And uh, two years ago, I started my press cram books. And the first book I published was a collection of diary comics by my friend Angela Fanch. Um, and the premise was to make like a precious object. So all the books are handmade and staple bound and. <laughs> unwieldy and burdensome um, but after sorry sorry it's it's been an ongoing project for the last two years um, but uh, after a year after I started doing an anthology as well called Cram Comics which is this book um, but I do everything on the risograph so all my books are um, handmade per se so. cool and then uh, my name is Avi I'm the publisher over at Silver Sprocket and um, you know we got our start go doing a bunch of rad indie small fests like this. And this is still definitely like our primary favorite thing in the world. Though now we also have books with spines and, you know, barcodes and all that sellout stuff. But um, but yeah, uh, so we're really excited to talk to you guys about small press publishing and indie, indie publishing. And one real central goal of this is we really want to try to demystify this whole process because you know, we there are so many amazing comics happening, and comic artists are so fun to work with to make something amazing, get out there in the world. 
And uh, we really want to show that this is, it's not without its challenges. It'll drive you fucking crazy. You'll make mistakes and lose money and hate your life sometimes. But it's also very rewarding and fun and you can really make a difference uh, in your community and you know just have a lot of fun making really cool stuff happen. So one thing I really want to focus on uh, in this panel is like some of those questions, some some conversation about how we actually literally got started. Um, you know, some early lessons or early learning experiences, um, and then uh, you know, if anything else naturally comes up, you know, I'm not going to be too much of a fascist about our topics. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions, and you know, we'd love to have a, you know, just see whatever whatever we can say or or help out with to help you hopefully on your journey to publish your own comics or try to provide answers to you know whatever made you want to come into this room in the first place so Hell sound yeah. cool sounds yeah. perfect perfect all right awesome um and yeah i just found uh this is the first silver sprocket comic that we ever did that was by ben passmore uh a million years ago and it was small it had no barcode we we spent way too much on it it like finally broke even like this year which is fucking crazy because it's like a decade old but <laughs> you know we we learned a lot doing it we were very patient with each other we kept working together and you know it i i think that's really like a, a key thing is you know trans well hey wait i'm moderating you guys are the panelists <laughs> yeah um the expert well yeah. But yeah, wait, like, I, I, I want I want to say this. You started making records first, right? That was yeah. That, that was your. We intro were to... like a like a record label with a lot of these cartoonists doing like our album covers and flyers and stuff. Sure. And, and selling comics in in store. Uh, yeah, we did like we we came from fanzines, not from mm -hmm. like books. So it it was like zine culture of like DIY, do it yourself, um, and then that kind of like ricocheted into. And I, I very foolishly thought that making comics was just as easy as making like the packaging for a record. Totally. Because like every record is like an insert. And it's like, oh, this is a comp. This could be a zine or a comic. Like, <laughs> but it has everything has its own set of challenges and you know market specific things. And totally. So there's always so much to learn. Um, I guess so. One thing I, I think I kind of just want to start off with is like, do. You, like how like how many years have all of you guys been publishing comics so far? Like just you know, quick. Twelve. Twelve or, years. Or, or, or like self-publishing for yeah. like twelve. Yeah. And then publishing for two. And publishing for two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, go, go. Uh, seventeen years of mini comics, and then I've been publishing for three now. So. Yeah, I've made a lot of zines before I ended up in this world of like comics and zines. Mm -hmm. I was. Big in zines. I started making zines probably 12 years ago, and then started making bubbles in 2019. I've never seen your comics. I'd love to see your comics. No, no I never made comics, but I made zines. Oh hell yeah! About other things. <laughs> <laughs> so, so bubbles here looks really sharp. You've got like what is this like eight like legal like uh, eight and a half by fourteen paper. That is a classic eight and a half, or eleven by seventeen piece of paper. And then trimmed down. To half to tabloid, tabloid folded cut. But what, uh, what did your humble beginnings look like? Like what were, mm. like where did, because <laughs> the, you didn't, this didn't come out of your brain, mind fully formed like yeah, a yeah. from Zeus. I, I always tell everyone who wants to make a zine like bubbles or something that you have to start a lot smaller. Um, yeah. My first zines were about VHS tapes. Probably those some of my first zines mm -hmm. about movies I liked and VHS tapes I owned. And they were quarter sized. So like, you know, a quarter size zine. And um, and I was just making much smaller, and they were more like eight pages or twelve pages. Mm -hmm. or, and I just it took me a decade to grow up to get up to being able to do something that I can wrap my head around something like this. I and did. I still can't even wrap my head around sometimes. And just for clarification, so when you say an eight page, you mean like a full like an eight half by eleven folded in half twice? Yeah. So yeah. I was cutting stable. them in half. Okay. Cutting a piece of paper like that in half and then folding it and doing that it. size. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then this was your zine. Yeah. The, right? yeah because eight those and are half the five. first stuff that I did too. Me, yeah. me and Max Huffman, who's table and we did a, an anthology called Weekly and it was three of us and we would each do two pages. That's mm -hmm. probably the easiest size yeah, it's the best. to like steal and get your money's worth. Yeah, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like, <laughs> <your money's laughs> worth like any any office because, that you because, work at. Because I I worked uh, every I have like a li I could list off all the scams I've ever had <laughs> and like make that but, scene. But, but but I can't tell. But <laughs> but though but eight and a half by eleven is just such an amazing size 
to work with, and there's a lot you can do beyond, um, and you know, you can always find a way to print them uh, somewhere for cheap that will, will allow you to, um, you know, I used to work at a convenience store, I'd just print them there, I worked at a convention center, I'd, I'd, like, I'd be like, oh, I'll work the overnight shift, and I would print them there, <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's, it's a really amazing format, um, and yeah, I still, like, you know, that size is forever. Yeah, it's it's a forever size. And and what's sick as hell is life hack is you just take a single piece of paper, you fold it twice, uh, then you you staple get down the middle, and then just take some scissors and chop the edges. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you've got an eight page zine, and it, it was free because you stole yeah. it from work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, do you have uh, any uh, humble beginnings you want to touch on real quick? Yeah, I mean, so you know, I dropped out of art school, um, and I was. At the time, I was seeing like all these comics that were coming out from people like Eleanor Davis and Drew Wang, and it was during this like this paper craft era of mini comic making, you know. So like this DIY, you know, specialty kind of printing, screen printing, all this stuff was starting to really take the forefront of what the mini comic scene was at the time. So that really influenced um, my initial like interest in mini comics, and then over time, that kind of grew into an interest in print in general, which kind of like led to my my career as a bookmaker um yeah but it, going back to what brian was saying you know early on it's all about like finding those resources that will work for you and taking advantage of them like i you know my friend had a had a college radio station show that he did at midnight and it was just um he would just play just noises he would play like whale noises for an hour so we'd go out of the office because he'd turn the whale noises on and we would just find the, all the photocopiers in the building and use them until they were out of toner. And then as time went on, we'd learn where the toner was. And then we would use it until we ran out of that toner. That's exactly mine. Yeah, yeah. So, and, but in doing that too, like you learn how a photocopier works because if you break it, you need to fix it so nobody finds out. So there's also this, like, this technical side of like learning how this machine works because you don't want anybody to know what you're doing. So yeah. it was a, you know, that was a really cool learning experience. I used experience. to take the old toner and I would go, I would like, hide them in a bag and I would take them to the compactor and I'd throw them in the compactor so like they were like <laughs> and then, then there was no evidence I was like don't want to ever no one find the know. old one to be like so they're supposed to return those to recycle them when they not these ones <laughs> <laughs> so so one theme that so uh, one one common theme that I'm hearing through from all of you is that None of you were like, hey, let me get like a ten thousand dollar investment or you know mm -hmm. borrow from money from someone you're Start with no money at all and slowly build it because, and, and I think that's extremely good, relevant advice for anyone self publishing because no matter what, when you're getting started, you're going to make mistakes. And if you've got $10,000 to play with, it's going to be a way more expensive mistake than if you have no money to play with and you like just printed your thing upside down or whatever. It's like, well, okay, I'm going to go back in tomorrow and try again. Yeah. Um, so on that note, um, I just, I guess, we, since we only have like 50 minutes, we can't like ramble for hours and for hours. Sure. And I, this is such an open question, but do you have any, like if you could go back in time to like talk to yourself in like your first year of trying to like really take your like self, your, your own DIY zine making up to your next level of like actually making it something that with, a, you know, the nicer production value and really trying to get it out there more and everything. Do you have any like lessons that you wish you can go back and give to younger versions of yourself? Like, a couple real quick, like, really important learning experiences that you wish you can make yourself listen to. And I no. will start with your end. No. no? Do you feel like you're still making the same mistakes? Or <laughs> the, mistakes? There, there are mistakes that I'll make when I'm like, this, amb this project is too ambitious and now I've sunk in time into something that is, like, going to take me a thousand hours over the course of years. But, um, but no, even the mistakes, it's like, I mean, I also am a cartoonist. I know Sean's also a cartoonist. And... My practice as a cartoonist is very separate from my bookmaking, printmaking practice. Mm -hmm. And I like printmaking and bookmaking because it's very practical and you learn pretty quick about like what not to do a second time. So everything needed to happen to get to this, you know, so. Okay. Do you do you think that you've learned any things that you can like help people in the audience like yeah. frog certain yeah. things that were like a bummer to have to learn the hard way that maybe they can learn from your mistakes rather than having to do it themselves? Always <laughs> always be delusional and be like, I, I got this. I'm, I'm the best. <laughs> always be delusional. Like like go big. 
go big because mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I did a book weekly annual with uh, Max Huffman and Jack Reese, and it was like this really intense project that had like three signatures that were staple bound on one sheet of paper with pop ups in each signature. It's but like, I'm so glad I did it. But at the same time, if I was to do it again, I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Like, we're never gonna do that again. It took forever. But would it have helped if you like made like five of them before you committed to doing like a hundred? No, because we wouldn't have done it. Do you, you know what I like? Like, oh, I had, it would have held had, you back. I would have held me back of being like, oh, is this possible? It's like, it is. You just have to do You're it. Like, well, shit. Now I have to. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's all printed. We have. I still have a box of printed material that I refuse to throw out because I'm like, one day the uh, the Infinity Stones will all come back together, <laughs> and I can make the book again. You should do like a zine making workshop where you just make like a an audience of people like put them together for you. It's like a learning. Oh yeah, experience. that's a that's a great idea actually. <laughs> mm. uh, Sean, huh? I got. I'm gonna put my teacher hat in on and be give like really dry practical advice um i think you know when you're making a book i think it's really good to make a dummy book before you actually make the book so what a dummy book is is you're just taking the materials that you're going to actually use for making the book and you're just making essentially a blank book and you're walking through all the processes of of trimming the paper binding the books folding the books and holding them and seeing how it feels and all those steps are going to inf- inform you of like some things that might be uh, limitations or frustrations with that project you might have when you're actually making the book so that that, that is really good yeah. advice because I, I have a i have a blank version of this that is just yeah, this exactly. size on blank paper same for this one this was like a 56 page uh booklet and i was really nervous about uh, would it would it staple right so i actually made the booklet and i stapled it and then i was also nervous about the creep so i was like well creep is when images get closer and closer to the edge mm-hmm. as you make a thicker booklet Right, so these are things I was thinking about. Like, okay, I'm going to staple this booklet. I'm going to trim it, and I'm going to take it apart, and I'm going to measure what this page is and what this page is because they're going to be different. Yeah. So I'm going to make sure that these margins are consistent based off that variance. Right. So, I mean, that's stuff you're going to learn over time as you're making books. But I think just initially, like making a blank book, just super simple, just understand what you're going to be doing with that book, and you might discover some weird complexities with the materials you're working with that might change some of your decisions. So. Yeah. We had a, a quick question right here. Yeah. Say when you do the signature yeah, with the printing, so you see what it looks like, mm-hmm. before you cut it, if you number each page and make sure the numbers are right side up, yeah. you can unfold it and it'll tell you where each page exactly. is going. Yeah. And it'll exactly. tell you if you've got it upside down. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And, what, and like this, yeah. <laughs> what I was showing right here of turning a, a one piece of paper into an eight page zine, that would be my next step is I would take the paper, fold it up, draw a really shitty sketch, just write like front cover, page one, and like yep. underline the numbers. And then when you open it back up, you know exactly which direction each of your pages yeah, is supposed like to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. I still make a mini version of each issue of Bubbles because I don't use InDesign. I know I probably could, but I- <laughs> I can teach you. I, if it's not, what'd you say? I can teach you. No, I know I do <laughs> actually use it for the books that I've published and I have learned it, sure. but it's just like, I kind of am stuck in my ways, and um, I, I think that's something that we've all learned is that like we've all asked, I would say like any advice would be like, don't be scared to ask questions. A lot of people will tell you how to do it, and they'll tell you what things that you're not thinking of. Like I was lucky to have Chris Pitzer from Ad House. He lives in Richmond as I live in Richmond, and he... You know, I just had like probably three big questions and it was just like he was able to just answer them in like one minute. And I was like, thank you. I just like really needed like I just don't, you know, the printer person you're going to work with, they might be helpful, but they're also busy and dealing with 10 other projects or more than that. So it's really nice to just, you know, be able to ask some questions and you'd be surprised. I mean, you know, a lot of people will definitely break down that wall because it is kind of hard. It's a little mysterious. Like, you know, a lot of people don't even know where most of the books come from that they're about buying, like who's actually printing them, who are these like mysterious like people printing them. So that's like, but um, getting that wall broken down is important. And I'll second that too, like being an indie comic community, like uh, we get so, even to this day as Silver Sprocket, like I'm constantly calling people at like Fantagraphics and Drawn and Quarterly, and even like First, Second and stuff to get advice about like how they did different things or what challenges they had. And people are so friendly and so happy to help 
like anybody who's like, oh, that's like our secret sauce. We kind of don't want to tell anyone. They're, they're pieces of shit. <laughs> they're, that's not the standard. If, if you do get that response, just ask someone else. Um, and, and I, you know, and I'm just gonna put everyone here on the spot and say like, if you've got simple questions or you want to just like tell us like in, in two paragraphs what your plan is. Like I think any of us would be happy to like give you some feedback and point out like here's some things that you might want to look out for, or be mindful about. Totally. Um, yeah. Yeah, my DMs are are open. I, I do get like a lot of DMs from like cartoonists that are like self publishing that will have like very technical questions, and I'm always happy to like get into the weeds about some of this stuff. So like, I mean, that's that's the the beauty of this kind of community is we can share that knowledge with each other. So yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so now like a slightly more meatier question. I'm curious, so now that you got, you, we all have been publishing for a little while and we've kind of like gotten in our grooves with the things that it is that we do, um, what, do what do you feel, like where do you feel that your publishing projects are succeeding the most at, at you know, however you would define what your goals are right now? And then on the other side of that coin, what are the challenges that you're presently the most focused on trying to overcome? Um, I'll, let's start with you, Brian, I guess, because I see you. Sure, sure. Um, so right now I am working with Ryan Holmberg, who's a manga translator and manga scholar. You maybe have some of his books. And we have um, a new judo manga um, coming out. It's like a late 40s judo manga. And um, anyway, so I'm working on that. I'm also publishing, I mentioned this guy from India that um, that is a, an amazing cartoonist that he doesn't have any books out in North America. And so I'm really excited to bring that over because he's amazing. Um, anyways, uh, my biggest challenges, I guess, uh, distribution is something that's like a really interesting um, thing. I'm not sure. Do any of you guys use a distributor? No, I do it all myself. I do it all myself, as, all well, myself as well, and it's and I, and I, I, I I've I've had great conversations with Floating World Comics, another great, uh, comic shop that has turned small publisher and does a lot of amazing stuff. And Jason was really nice talking to me on the phone once for like maybe an hour almost telling me about how to do legit distribution. But uh, I actually kind of find it interesting to kind of own my own stuff um, and kind of have power of like where, who has my stuff and where you can get it. Like Bat Kid doesn't have an Amazon page. That's like the judo, there's the baseball manga that I've published and sold, luckily sold out of, which was amazing. But I am gonna reprint it. But anyways, I love that there's not an Amazon page for it and I love that um, I kind of have, because I feel like that kind of stuff is, you know, of course we all know it's poisonous. I mean, we've all used it, but we've also, um, you know, it's hard when they're undercutting you on your own product or something like that. So, yeah. but distribution is definitely a challenge. I contact a lot of stores across the world working very hard to have affordable shipping to somehow make it work to, to try and get uh, books into stores and just... Yeah, so that's definitely a forever challenge, I think. Yeah, distribution was going to be my answer for the challenge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the success side of things, like what's worked really well so far with publishing, I'd say is actually getting cartoonists that aren't necessarily always in comic book stores, getting them into comic book stores. You know, like having Rust Belt Review has been like a really palatable thing to sell to comic book shops um, because... Uh, you know, it's like a pretty looking book. It looks pretty professional. And it's a, also a venue for people that might be a little earlier in their careers that haven't had the opportunity to make something look that professional yet. So they're not necessarily getting their work in the store. So I feel like we've made a lot of uh, uh, great uh, success in, in that area of getting the work into stores. The challenge, I would say, is just like marketing on the other end of things, like marketing directly to readers. Like... Um, I think that's a constantly shifting environment and what had worked three years ago doesn't work anymore. And that's like by design by the people that run like social media and like all these other platforms, like everyone wants a cut of what you're doing. It's always getting more difficult. They want you to play by their rules. Um, so that's a thing I'm kind of working with right now is like, how do I get back in touch directly with uh, readers? Uh, because it's you know it's it's changed so much in just three years so that's that's the current challenge I'd say. Um, it sounds like distribution really was a, a common theme over here, and I'm wondering like could you touch on just briefly uh, like what how, what is your distribution like what how do your comics literally get to people like what are the different channels that they go through? Yeah, um, 
Yeah, distribution is also like it's just the the hardest thing. I mean, I email comic shops, or comic shops will email me, and then we work at a rate for wholesale. And it's usually pretty standard. Standard, in case you want to know, standard is usually sixty forty. You, mm-hmm. the publisher, would take sixty, and they would pay. Wait, I'm saying this so backwards. So you get four dollars for every ten dollar book. I get six dollars for every ten dollar book. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and sometimes it's fifty fifty, but that's pretty standard. And then, um, yeah. So I, I mail out books myself, and I contact shops, and I make sure that I can restock shops when they sell out. And um, so that's most of what the printing end is: is just making sure the book is out there. Otherwise. You printed it for no reason. Who pays the shipping on that? Um, they usually pay the shipping. I usually put in the invoice for them to pay the shipping. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mine's the same. Same story, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think I wanted to bring up one other thing that I, uh, if I had to give advice. Yeah, please. It was that we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Was that like uh, with the first book I did? It was like this diary about manga history that Ryan Holmberg. Um, it was like his Instagram post. If I don't know if anyone follows him on Instagram, but they're incredibly long. So I was like, we should do a book because it sucks to read them on your phone. I fucking hate it. And I was like, it would be a great book though. So we made a book, and I uh, kind of like underprinted it. And I and I think that like it's important to make things accessible. And like, I have reprinted it once, but it's gone again. And like that's something I, I wish I could go back and like. What's the print run? What's the first print run? 600 or something sure. and then I think we did another 300 or something yeah. it was just something where I like I wish I had I could go wish I could go back in time and be like believe in yourself like, yeah if you believe totally. in 600 then just do a thousand if you believe in a thousand yeah. then do and 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 just like there's nothing wrong with having books sitting around um there's nothing wrong like you know of course we all want to break even and or at least or maybe make some money but maybe break even is the best at least and um but I definitely think uh, there's like this culture now of like supreme drop sellout kind of like stuff that I, th- I think has creeped its way into like record sales and book sales that it's like if you weren't there the day it came out then you don't get this thing and I, and I think that there's actually that's like not good like we want like you know comic book sellers they want to have a book that they love on their shelves for years like they you know I get hit up for bat kid all the time and I'm like it's coming I swear and I'm gonna make more because people still want it and I feel bad that it's like in one year it became a collector's item I don't want that I I was talking to Dennis Kitchen yesterday and Mm -hmm. we were just talking about distribution and like how it could be better do you know that every book they made 10,000 every every comic they've ever made 10,000 because they've had distribution and so like I always think in that I'm like the distribution is all on the onus of the person printing now and so like the numbers have changed there's no like there's no like fanographics drawn in quarterly and silver sprocket we have barely any books that we will do 10,000 of yeah yeah there's and we have distribution mm-hmm. <laughs> like the world's changed but um yeah, yeah I mean yeah. one piece of advice if I'm going to answer my own curated question um is uh, think about the finances of what your project is and have a plan for success, not just breaking even. Um, I think it's really common to be like, okay, I'm so proud of this book. Uh, they'll cost me like eight bucks each to make. I can sell them for 10 bucks and you know make my money back or whatever. But then like the yeah. problem is, it's like, what are your goals after you sell out of your first print run? And I think a good set of goals to have in place is to pay yourself back. Um, so, and then, so well, I think the goals are when you sell out of a book is have enough money to reprint it so it's not gone forever once it's done. Also have enough money to print your next project so you're, you can reprint the project that you already did, you can print your next project and pay yourself. So that's typically thought of as like the rule of threes, which is whatever your production costs are, say a dollar each, sell it for at least three dollars. So that way you, you have these three pots of money that come in that you can use to keep the project in existence, pay yourself, and then do something new. And then once you're working with distribution, as we've talked about here, um, most stores buy books at 50% of the retail price. Like that's the standard. Yeah. There's some some stores are like super indie friendly and just really want to support indie DIY stuff, and they'll buy them at 60%. But that is the exception. And usually they're they're it's not even that that good. It's like they're fifty percent off, and they want you to cover the shipping, mm-hmm. like because that's what they get from all of the mainstream distributors. Like that's just industry standard. So once you're doing that, the rule of threes becomes a rule of tens. Where as a publisher with distribution, we 
Well, when you're when you're when you're when you're printing a hundred copies by hand, the rule of threes or the rule of fives works. But once you're like a bigger publisher with like actual like book trade distribution, um, because of like all the different levels of sub distribution and different people taking a cut, you have to multiply your production costs by ten if you want to be able to break even, pay the artist, cover your cost, and do the next project. Um, and it makes sense because you're printing like two or three thousand or more at a time, so your production costs per per item drops way down. But um, it's just just a thing to be mindful about. Like, don't pit yourself in the corner. Like, it's you're like, cool, I sold out of my book. I don't have any money to reprint it. I don't have any money to do my next project. It's like, fuck, I didn't plan to be successful. Mm, it's a good um, advice. Yeah. But it's at the same time though, it's very hard to unprint a book. So if you have your book. <laughs> Like, I mean, really the move is you, you self-publish it, do 100 copies or 50 copies, sell out of them, and then go, okay, cool, people are still hounding me for this. Now that I've sold out of that 50 or 100, let me look at my sample copy and find all the typos and mistakes that I wish I had oh, yeah. caught, like fix all of them, then figure out how to do an offset print run of 1,000 or 2,000. But like once you already know that there's a demand, you know who's bothering you for copies, you know like what distribution you want to use for it, like and have a plan for it to, to make more and like really believe in the project, like print enough to be able to keep it in stock. A lot of those boxes are gonna be your furniture for a while, but like so fucking what? This is the path you've chosen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I wanna say something that we all have in common that not every small publisher does is that we actually we all make our own things yeah. like actually like we use the resources that we have andrew has a risograph printer and so mm -hmm. that's what he works with sean works at a book place and actually makes these books and then i just have access to xerox and so and i'm not like ashamed i don't want it to be anything more like i think that the, part of like what i want to do with bubbles is just be like it's all about the content it's not really I don't really care if it's printed really nice or anything. Like I want it to look decent and be readable, but you know, I love old zines that's just about content and keeping it cheap and making sure that people get their eight dollars worth. And so I think like working within what you have, paying attention to what you have access to is also a great way to get started and you know, it's a path of some success. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Do you guys have any like um before we open up to questions, do you have any other topics do you think we should try to talk about or you know, any stray thoughts in your mind that you think are would contribute or be fun? Empty head, smooth brain. <laughs> well yeah, let's do this. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess let's open it up for questions from the audience. Um I'm gonna go uh you first, then you and then you, and then I'll we'll ask another round of questions. So uh, yes. Yeah, when you're doing like anthologies and pulling work from artists, do you have a difficult time maybe with, uh, how would I say this, like content control and like the quality of work that you're looking to get? So uh, I've asked to re repeat the questions for the internet because they don't have a microphone. So I guess the question is kind of uh, how do you how do you deal with quality control and curation if you're you're getting something from an artist? And making sure that I, I'm putting words in your mouth no, here, so please tell me. And yes. making sure that it's up to snuff for what you want to publish after you've asked for it. Yeah. Um, I, I I try to be honest. Like, uh, if something and most of the time when I'm working with an artist, like I work with artists on Cram and also Ecotone, uh, which is like a drawing anthology um, of like contemporary artists. But I try to be honest of when I get something from an artist that it's not up to the quality that I know that they are because I know the artist and I have, will have a relationship and just being honest and being like I think this piece is a little lazy and I don't I'm not there you could do better than this and you know just being honest is always my policy but but it has led to mixed reviews and, and some arguments <laughs> but um yeah so I generally I kind of treat like when somebody somebody submits something for the anthology, I kind of treat it like a, an opportunity for a crit session. So even if there's not something that necessarily needs to be improved, and I think there's just a worthwhile conversation to be had, I'll open it up that way. But when it comes to quality control, like you know, people that do submit to to Rust Belt Review, like I'll either reach out to them directly or they'll they'll go through my submissions process, which includes an ask that they send a sample of comics work they've done in the past so there's some level of 
me assessing that work and seeing if that if I feel like they're reliably and consistently creating work at that level before I make that decision to put them in the book. So I haven't had a situation yet where someone's kind of like um, written off the project because everybody that's in it really wants to be in it and they're excited about it. But there have been occasions where um, maybe the, there is something that I perceive as a legibility issue or an opportunity to kind of strengthen the piece. And I'll, I'll put in my two cents on that, but I always try and emphasize that, you know, what this publication is, is a venue for you and your work. And if you feel like this is the best solution for what the story is, then I want you to go with that. But here's my two cents on it. Yeah. Yeah. You got anything? Cause, all right. Yeah. It's more your own work. Uh, I, and, <laughs> you know, this is one of those major learning experiences. Um, for me personally, it's Silver Sprocket is, um, we started out doing um, anthology comics, um, and earlier on, I was like, oh, I love this artist. I want to invite them to be in the thing. And then they'd turn in something, and it's fucking terrible. And I'm like, wow, you worked really hard on this. I invited you to be in this. I can't mm -hmm. just not use it because you turned it in. So with that experience, I had to kind of change the way that I do that. And um, what's really vital is just to have um, a clear set, just really clear communication up front about what the process is and how it's going to go. So now if I'm, if I'm soliciting something from someone, I tell them, because I'm not the artist, I don't want to tell anyone what to do, but I do want to have it be up to a level of quality and, um, and I, want, I want to let them, so, well, so anyway, we, I made clear from the offset, hey, we really want you in this. Before you sat, sit down and do the final pages, we want like just the shittiest, roughest, roughest, roughest sketches like that you can make just just the shittiest thumbnails possible just so so you know that there's going to be a back and forth of a thumbs up or a, a little question or comment and collaboration and we let them know like when and where along the process the different rounds of feedback are going to happen and have have that expectation baked into the conversation from the very beginning so it's not a surprise to anyone no one's like pissed off that you've wasted their time and energy um and i'm also like very clear like hey i'm not telling you what to do like i'm not you're not, this isn't like some work for hire, like where you're, I'm paying you millions of dollars to like do exactly what I want. Like, this is the type of feedback that I will give you, which is gonna be like, do I understand this? Uh, what do I take from reading this? Is that what you want someone else to take from reading it? Or like, like even grammar or whatever. So just setting those expectations early and having a, a clearly mutually understood understanding of how that feedback and iterative process is gonna go. And, and being as direct and honest as soon as possible. But um, the, the most important thing though is like, don't let them just create their work in a vacuum without feedback. It's you really wanna be checked in along the way so that there's opportunities for feedback before you're at a point of no return where it's like, wow, you spent a month on this and it's the wrong size or mm -hmm. you completely misunderstood the assignment or like <laughs> the, what the, they're all naked. This is a kid's book. Like, yeah. So, um, yeah, and then uh, someone in back. Or I'm sorry, did that answer? Was that a good? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, great. thank you. Well, before I get into my question, uh, I want to add to the sentiment of don't be afraid to read them out because I want to say, first of all, thank you, Avi, for responding to an email that I sent in last year asking about paper stock that was too big for cat boys because that helped me in. Hell yeah. <laughs> helped me with uh, my journey in trying to find the right paper stock in my book and kind of helping narrow things down. And kind of to piggyback on that, for all of you, when the project either, either like asks or demands for it or things just line up the right way, how or what advice would you give in terms of, or experience have you had in terms of finding the right printer for the project? All right, so the comment was <laughs> first a thumbs up to reaching out to people for help with an appreciation for that, that people are down to be helpful and share resources. So fuck yeah, comics community is amazing. Oh yeah. And then the second question, and the, then the question was, how do you go about finding what printer to use for whatever the project is? I, I, I wake up and I'm like, I'm the right printer. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the guy. Um, I don't know. I, I ask people and like, I have a lot of friends who make books and a lot of different types of art books. So I always have like, you know, a network of people where I'm like, what, how'd you make that? How'd you make that? How'd you make that? What's what's the rate? What's the rate? So, just asking, honestly. Yeah, comics community is very open, and it'll tell you what rates they do, and 
you can see the books when they publish them and everyone kind of checks in on the books like, oh yeah, this publisher is publishing good stuff now or this printer is printing really well. So, Yeah, I would say, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend just like Googling like book printer or mm -mm. print my comic because nope. the people that are, the printers that are doing that are the people that are just trying to get as much work in it as possible and they're not necessarily concerned with the quality of the book. They just want to lure you in. So if you're making a comic book and you say, print my comic, and you see the first thing in Google, like, don't go to that. Uh, what you should be doing is reaching. Second one. Go to the second, <laughs> second page. page. <laughs> Click page two. Yeah, page two. You know, that's but, real, that's <laughs> where you find the real ones. No, but Dark yeah, world. I mean, again, <laughs> to reiterate, like asking asking other people that have printed stuff where where what's you know what printers have worked for them really well and what haven't, mm -hmm. but also consider like the the format of your book might not be the best fit for a printer, even if they're a great printer, it might not be like what they're really good at. So it's really that about that too, when you're when you're looking at a printer and you're like, man, these prices are really, I didn't expect this to be this high, like try another printer because the thing that yeah. you're asking them for might not be a good fit for whatever their internal processes are. So uh, there might be a shop that can do that more efficiently and still have a pretty solid quality. So like, you know, get, get multiple quotes, you know, uh, and do a little research by asking other uh, people that have printed stuff, like what places have worked for them. Um, because every shop does things a little bit different and their every shop has a strength and a weakness. So yeah, yeah that's basically what I did. I've done three books and uh, I asked Chris Pitzer where Ad House printed. I thought their books looked pretty nice. They looked professional to me. They looked as good as everyone else's books. And so <laughs> he told me Marquis in Canada, M-A-R-Q-U-I-S, not like E-E. Uh, and that's who I've been using. And they've been really cool. And uh, they print pretty nicely. And I'm going to have some books delivered to me next week. And so hopefully they also look really nice. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that's kind of what I did. I asked. And, uh, you know, they've actually been a pretty cool printer to work with when I have questions and stuff they I've had some very nice explaining emails because I don't know really what I'm doing and so I've had some really nice emails helping me out which I appreciate from someone who I'm about to spend a lot of money with <laughs> so yeah like if, if you google it the people you find are generally not even the printers they're like a, a broker who wants to take your job and then package it together and send it to a printer and just be a middle person um, and like you can go with like you know print ninja or mixum or ps print or whatever and those are like entry level print shops that know that they're working with people who don't have much printing experience so part of their price of part of the printing cost is that they know they have to do a level of customer service whereas there's like another level of print shops that will not be customer service friendly at all they don't want to explain the difference between papers. They they just want you to know exactly what you're doing and turn in the files exactly right so that they can just put it right into their system and have it work. So it's really like, yeah. I, I mean, the real answer is just talking to other people who have done what you what you want to do and just see what they have to say and talk to different people. Um, I will say we used to print a lot with Marquee, but the past couple of years, <laughs> their quality control has really gone to shit. They've um, They've acquired a bunch of other companies. Been My book is going to look really good, though. <laughs> no, <yours will. laughs> and you should buy it. But, um, but I just, just for the record, though, like I'll say that back in the day, I really liked Marquee a lot. And now we get our books much cheaper and faster with places overseas, if you're comfortable with that. Marquee also like won't tell you if certain elements of the book printing are something that they don't, that they don't do in-house, mm -hmm. that they get from a gotcha. different printer. So for example, we got like cool foil covers on a book. And we were like, cool, foil covers. But what we didn't know is that Marquis didn't do that. They got them from a different printer. And when that other printer made a mistake, it made the whole project take an extra month because it wasn't like Marquis could just in-house fix the thing and do it. It was like a whole rigmarole. Anyways, totally off topic, micro-focusing on one <laughs> printer. Um, all right, so there was a question over here, and then you'll be next. Yeah, I was wondering, because I know you guys do a lot of your own comics or you know, have the submission process. But what does it look like outside of that? Do you guys um, seek out artists? Do artists seek out you outside of the submission process? What kind of does that collection of that look like? Um, I kind of want my zine to be my main thing. Mm -hmm. And as, as far as the publishing, it's been me just kind of seeking things out. Not, not even seeking things out. Me, things have, that have come to me that have, I just thought no one else was doing. Um, you know, me and Ryan Hornbrook have become good friends. And so we wanted to just have some fun and make a, 
baseball comic together. That was we the love first baseball one because we love baseball. We love baseball. <laughs> baseball fans. We love so, big, big baseball fans. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and as far as this new book, this Indian cartoonist Anand, I felt like no one was really paying attention to him, and I and I I really think his work is amazing. And so I just believe in it. And so I wanted to just, you know, that's all I'm doing is trying to make some books. I mean, I have a day job, so I'm not like, uh, you know, this is me trying to just make some objects that I wish existed. And I, so that's kind of where I'm at as far as that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm, you know, a couple times a year, I'll, I'll send out some feelers to people. Usually if I'm asking somebody to be in Rust Belt Review, it's somebody I know, because again, like, I want to make sure it's somebody that's like committed to the project that's doing it and not somebody that feels like I'm like twisting their arm. Right. So I'm kind of, I try and I kind of try and feel that, that out a little bit. So, um, I probably should reach out to people more than I do. Cause to be frank, like I've never reached out to a publisher for anything that I've ever had published. They've always reached out to me because I've, I just don't have any spine. So I think there's probably a lot of other cartoonists like me that are like, I, I will I would like to be in that thing, but I'm not going to talk to, the publisher so um that's a th i think that's a that's an area of of growth for me i think is reaching out to more people <laughs> yeah I, I i i am um aggressive at times so i i reach out to the artist pretty like hey do you want to be in this thing and then like we've never met i know we've never met but do you want to but and so like um part of part of publishing for me is like the networking of like meeting people who are doing like-minded things and um being able to like spread that work um, and so, yeah, I, usually it's me reaching out to people. That's part of my publishing practice. Yeah, and I would say a lot of the bigger publishers like have it just written on their website. Like if they have a submission policy, I mean, I know for Silver Sprocket, we, we typically don't work with people who haven't already self-published something because we need to know that they know how to finish a project and see like, there's so many things you learn making your first comic and we don't have the bandwidth to like, hold your hand through all that, though we do hold our artist's hands through everything. Um, <laughs> but like uh, most of what we publish is initially self-published by an artist before we reissue it for further distribution and marketing. And uh, we do open submissions sometimes, but really it's going to conventions, seeing what other people are doing, seeing things on the internet, and it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, any other? Oh, you're telling me how much time we have left, yeah, not a question. Time. Two All right, minutes. we have two minutes left. Is there any last questions? Yes, they answered my question. So okay. cool. Yeah, right, uh, right here. Oh, sorry. Um, so me we'll and, uh, my friend, we, we made this magazine, Mojo Dude Magazine. Uh, and something that was really kind of difficult and confusing during the process was we were, we were getting it out for free, so we weren't taking any money. So luckily, we didn't have to deal with it. But we had over thirty contributors, um, and in the event of us selling this, we would have to figure out a way to like pay them. Do you have any advice or like, yes. just like methods on how to pay your artists? So there's a couple of different ways depending on how organized. You, can I, I'm just going to take this. No, take it. Go. I like I, I, I stole your method. I, I heard this before. So. I don't even know what it was at the time. Okay, um, well. well, there's a couple of things you can do. You can say, hey, we're doing a print run of this many, and I'm just going to have this many of them be for the artist involved, like at a ratio of like, so for every page in the book, you get like two copies or five copies or whatever. Um, that works, so they're just literally getting product that they can sell themselves. Uh, the other way is um, you have a way of collecting royalties where you just say like, okay, for every copy sold, I'm taking X amount of money, and that's getting split proportionally between the artist, or uh, we're gonna take all the money, all, that, all the expenses minus all the profits, and then split that up uh, proportionally. But really, the simpler you can make it, the better, because trying to coordinate 30 artists is a nightmare. Um, and especially on an anthology, like you want you want to be working with artists who have hustle, who are going to be promoting it. Like I think splitting up books is like really like the best thing you can do at that early stage. Yeah. Any other? I yeah. Do, I do the same thing. Every contributor gets twenty copies, which is like three hundred dollars worth of comic, something like that. Yeah. Don't let anyone work for free. Like yeah. even if they want to, it's just not cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Last question in back. No. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, you know, since my my like goes like this sort of went away. Overnight, and now we're starting to come back. Yeah. And so a lot of people trying to buy comics, the cost of shipping is like it doubles the cost of comics and things like that. I'm curious when you think about distribution, what what are roles like this show for, for all of you going forward in sort of getting comics back out? Where because I mean we were talking about sort of like it's limited runs, and so you want to buy them when you see them go online, but you don't know if they're going to show up at a show and 
how do you think about having comics to bring to people and sort of going up in shows like this and like is it is it marketing is it part of the sales strategy like how do you think about are you asking like why do we bring books to shows like this no not why but like like in the, like what what is the what is the role of shows like this in the future for, for small Shows like this are for community, for outreach, for be, having a chance to celebrate each other. Because you make comics by yourself in a basement, they get read by someone else by themselves in a basement. Uh, so being able to know that you're that you're connected to people is, is so fucking important. You get to yeah. Yeah. I, I work really hard to also to have my shipping rates be as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. I've spent hours and hours, and I could talk about shipping for over an hour. Yeah, that question. <laughs> that, that is wasn't supposed to be like a topic. Topic. Yeah. but I could talk about shipping forever how to do it internationally, because I think, you know, how to make zines or books a certain weight, below a certain weight, to ship correctly, yeah. to ship in a certain method. Um, if you're into making mini comics, I recommend looking up the international stamp. It is a dollar fifty stamp that'll send you a, your little zine anywhere in the world. And so you can not what? have... <laughs> yes. If it's, well, it's got to be a certain size, gamer. right? It's got to be... Like, yeah, it can, yeah. Wait, no, it can be, it can be this size. It can be... The, yeah. it, it, uh, yeah, a, 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 a this size. No, but it can be a little bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 a letter in America is a, is actually bigger than you think. Anyways, look up the international stamp. Make a zine that weighs less than an ounce. Ship it anywhere. No one in anywhere in Europe can be like, oh, I wish. Right. Anyways, I'm, I'm getting the signal it. that we're out of time, and this room thank is about so to much. be filled with piranhas. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.